Hello everyone and welcome to The Download where we here at churchmilitant.com bring you the latest and the best in Catholic discussion. I'm Michael Vorce and joining us at the desk today is our legal expert, Christine Niles. She's really smart, she's got law degrees, went to Oxford, all that kind of stuff. She loves me saying all that. <laughs> and our expert in everything, of course, is Simon Rafe. Today we're talking about the bishops hiding behind their nonprofit status. They get that from the IRS, you know, all about it. But before we get into that, our top stories. First, Wuhan lockdowns are like slavery. Then protesters may get the book thrown at them. And finally, riots cost billions. Simon, start us off. Thank you, Mike. A Trump official is ripping national lockdowns as comparable to slavery. Yesterday, Attorney General William Barr weighed in on his view of the Wuhan virus restrictions during a talk at Hillsdale College here in Michigan. It's, you know, other than slavery, which was a different kind of restraint, this is the greatest intrusion on civil liberties in American history. He compares the mandatory stay-at-home orders to house arrest. So obviously, William Barr there is saying, you know, other than slavery, this is the, the, the worst thing that, that, that it is, you know, because, of course, uh, you know, in slavery, you are compelled to work for somebody else and you'll have to stay where you are and all this. In this scenario, you were compelled to not work in many cases, but you had to stay where you were. It's exactly yeah. like house arrest. It's, it, it's uh, I mean, th yeah, there is no way to get around this other than saying this was like, like a house arrest. This is exactly, yeah. if you remember, he did the interview with uh, Roger Stone. Uh, it wasn't a Wuhan virus, but it's the same thing. He was placed under house arrest, uh, and he said, you know, before that, he was having this, you know, come back to the faith moment, God bless him. And he said during that interview that uh, once he was placed under house arrest, the Catholic church he used to go to three or four blocks away from him, he'd go in there and pray by himself in the middle of the day and things like that. He, he said, oh my gosh, all of a sudden I couldn't go into it anymore. I yep. couldn't leave my house. I was tethered and I couldn't leave my house. And then the Wuhan virus uh, restrictions kicked in uh, there as well, just sort of doubled down on him. But yeah, of course it's slavery. I mean, another thing people seem to forget about all the time is, you know, 40% of the Canadian population lives right on the border within 10 miles of the U.S. border. And Many people have families on both sides of the borders. You know, we've had people who work here who that's yeah. the case. And they can't get back and forth exactly. to even see their families. And, and you're yeah. breaking, I mean, it's, yes, it, it's not slavery, but I, I got to agree, it's the greatest bunch of restrictions and on not freedom. And not to mention the spike in suicides, the spike in yeah. domestic abuse, child abuse, horrible things happening during these lockdowns. Yeah, yeah. it's it's atrocious. Yeah. So. Meanwhile, the Attorney General also wants to prosecute rioters for insurrection. Leftist media is going crazy over the fact that William Barr is asking federal prosecutors to charge violent protesters with sedition. However, he is denying accusations that he told federal attorneys to charge Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin uh, with sedition for her negligence with regard to the police-free protest zone earlier this summer known as CHOP, where at least one person wound up dead. Critics say the victim's blood is on Durkin's head. You know, I would not have a problem if Barr wanted to charge yeah, Durkin with sedition. Go ahead, why not? She absolutely yeah. uh, is responsible for the death of that person. Yeah. I mean, that that may be some kind of political distinction and decision there, but I think it's absolutely correct to discuss charging the, those guys in Chaz or Chop or whatever they're calling it nowadays um, with insurrection, sedition, uh, you know, secession. I mean, the, we, we saw signs saw sign. when you went in. It says you are now leaving the United States. Okay, well, that that that's like straight up. Session, uh, you know, yeah. and, and, you and know, that's 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 right. yeah. I mean, charge them with it. And yeah. sedition is specifically a charge of the you know plotting to overthrow the government. If you have watched Antifa BLM riots, they're literally chanting "Death to America." Mm -hmm. That's what they want. They want to overthrow the government. It's kind so, of the video definition of sedition. Yeah, sedition, so yeah. go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I think I, it's a, an important point to look at there. And one of the things that even if you can't charge Durkin with some kind of crime, you've got to look at her and go, you completely failed in your duty as the local completely. executive in sure. that there was no United States government in that few block area. There was no law enforcement. There was no uh, protection. There was exactly. no uh, enforcement of contracts or agreements. All of the things that a government is supposed to provide broke down and failed that. That's not an attempt at sedition, that is successful it sedition. Was, it was utterly disgraceful. Yeah, um, I mean, and Remember, one of the things they went after was the federal courthouse, and that yes. topic came up during the bar hearings in front yep. of the, in Congress. He says, oh, is this okay now to attack a federal courthouse? Is that the bar? You mm -hmm. have to pass that before it becomes dangerous and sedition and everything else? I mean, yeah, it, it's, that was in Portland. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it was in Portland, but, but, but it's the but same, both, goes, feeds into the same both narrative Both mayors here. were worthless, totally useless. Yeah. Mayor Ted Wheeler, Man yeah. Mayor uh, Jenny Durk, yeah. Totally useless. Remember, people straight up died in these situations. They died. They, they, were died, raped, they, they were murdered, and the everything. whole thing. Yeah, yeah. This, this wasn't just like some summer of love fun times. Exactly.
And of course, in other riot news, we should have like a riot news segment in, in here somewhere. It's called the news. <laughs> yeah. In other riot news, BLM and Antifa riots are the most expensive in U.S. history with damage in the billions of dollars. A new report is revealing the riots that started in April have cost nearly two billion dollars, and that's just factoring in the physical destruction of the buildings, just the property damage. The violence has cost cities tens of millions of dollars in police overtime costs, as well as other expenses like people not being able to work owing to riots happening near their workplaces. You know, the, it, it, natural, big giant natural catastrophes run up much larger bills than that. But those are hurricanes. Those are tornadoes. I mean, those are tsunamis and earthquakes. And, you know, when, when it, it, that you could run up this sort of charge, the insurance companies can't keep handling billions and hundreds of billions of dollars in payouts, especially when it's not necessary. Yeah. This never should have happened. Yeah, it should it, never have happened. Protests, great. Riots, no. But there became a point where, you know, the Democrats let all this happen mm -hmm. because they saw some sort of political advantage in it and they don't give a hoot. They don't give about your business, your money, people committing suicide, going into, they don't care about anything except power. That's yeah. all they want. And I think one of the great ironies of this, obviously, because we're looking at these, these are the BLM and Antifa riots. So BLM is obviously a Black Lives Matter and it's focusing you know, on people of color. They want to improve the lot of people of color as their stated thing. And Antifa, of course, are very much for the little man that's the idea well okay yeah. this the damage done was not to the infrastructure of, 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 of the federal system it was not done to the local Ku Klux Klan clubhouse or right. something like this it was done to small mom-and-pop stores these tiny little businesses disproportionately in many cases because these were in urban areas that are owned by people of color. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, great, congratulations, yeah, whoopie exactly. do BLM. Rasmussen came out with a poll this morning and said the, uh, uh, the amount of support uh, for uh, Trump and police Never in those areas is oh, it's off the charts. Yep. Of course it would be. How yep. could you live in any, not necessarily in the burn zone, that's kind mm -hmm. of a no-duh, but even around it, five, ten blocks around mm -hmm. it, how could you possibly feel safe? How could you possibly feel like have a certainty, oh, I can go to work the next day and things will be okay? You know, that's how you make livelihood, you a livelihood and you take care of your children. It's revolting yeah. what it's, these men will do, to, men and women will do to just get power. Yeah, yeah, to get power and to hold on to it. Well, those are today's top stories. After the break, we will break down the lie of separation and church and state. We'll be back in a bit. Last year was one of the biggest crises in the world today. Our plastics in the ocean. It's a big problem again, and the once mighty Jesuits have generally descended into moral degeneracy, and this includes their embrace of homosexuality. He said, in his opinion, the majority of the bishops go to hell. This is really what the left does. It takes some questionable teachings of certain people and then twists them to their own liking. Exclusively at churchmilitant.com. U.S. bishops have, for the most part, failed to teach and protect Catholics. And with today's political climate, it's more obvious than ever that they're pushing a gospel that belongs not to, that belongs to the world, not Christ. And as, as hostility grows against Catholics and Christians in general, Christians have to now fight to keep their places of worship open. More on this with our own David Newsman. That was one of his big things last year was one of the biggest crises. $100,000 in fines for singing in church. That's the penalty for a Baptist pastor in Santa Clara, California, for having indoor Sunday services with music and preaching. Jack Treber is one of many Protestant leaders resisting coronavirus lockdowns in the state of California. In a pre-produced video last month, Treber slammed the government for trampling on religious liberty. They posted on our doors on Friday that we have to cease and desist. Those words are horrifying to me. That someone could post that a church in America has to cease. The fines and penalties increased week after week as North Valley Baptist Church continued having Sunday services in defiance of government orders. He's not the only religious leader taking a stand in California. About six months have passed since the COVID lockdown began and Christians in the Golden State are tired of public worship being illegal. Pastor Rob McCoy, 
of Godspeed Calvary Chapel in Ventura County is likewise facing fines for holding services. Also worth mentioning is John MacArthur, pastor of Grace Community Church in Los Angeles County. He began holding in-person services in July and sued the county in August. The lawsuit claims county officials turned a blind eye to protesters while cracking down on people of faith. Last week, a judge ordered MacArthur to stop in-person worship. Around the country, churchgoers were banished from public worship for months amid panic over the Wuhan virus pandemic. The situation was grim for practicing Catholics as every diocese in the country canceled public mass. Churches sat empty, even during the liturgies of Holy Week. Some clergy found creative workarounds like drive through confession or offering mass outdoors. Almighty and eternal God. Recently in San Francisco, Archbishop Salvatore Cordeleone had multiple masses being offered simultaneously to get around the government limit of 12 people per religious service. Even in places where public worship is allowed again, parishes often require masks and social distancing making it unclear how long it will be before parish life returns to normal, if ever. David Newsman, Church Militant, Detroit. Yeah, so obviously we're looking there in Dave's great package of a one aspect of religious freedom in the United States being, being curtailed is the aspect to actually go and to worship. But there is another aspect of religious freedom that's kind of been curtailed from, from a long time. Uh, and it is the ability to speak your mind as a religious organization on a political issue. However, Donald Trump, okay, who gets, you know, people saying, oh my gosh, you know, Donald Trump, not a terribly religious man, maybe a terrible man individually. And we've said all these things, I've said all these things, but friend of religious liberty, friend of religious freedom in general. He, he does get it. And, and in May uh, of 2017, President Trump issued an executive order. Now, this was uh, a historic order, and we see it here. Uh, obviously, you can't read the small print there, but basically what it says is it says that religious nonprofits are allowed to engage in uh, political endorsements and this sort of stuff uh, by, by, by the way that they do that. And obviously, Trump made kind of quite a big deal of this at the time. He announced it from the Rose Garden, you know, as he always does, because he's a bit of a showman and he does all of that kind of stuff there. But um, it didn't get much coverage in the media at the time, which I'm really actually quite surprised about. Um, we have actually covered it recently, though, with our recent interview with uh, the chairman of the FEC, um, but also we've issued this uh, great little uh, FAQ sort of guideline of, of political activity for faith-based nonprofits. Now, here is the relevant section from the uh, executive order, which says, the Treasury of the Secretary shall ensure that the Department of the Treasury does not take any adverse action against any individual house of worship or other religious organization on the basis that such individual or organization speaks or has spoken about moral or political issues from a religious perspective. Now, what that is, is that's kind of taking a leaf from Barack Obama's playbook, sure. which is where, like, you know what, I can't change the law but instead what I'll do is I'll just decide which laws I'm going to enforce. But that's very, very important because right there we have this situation where Donald Trump is saying the Treasury will not prosecute you for engaging in this uh, political endorsement. So there's no reason why some religious organization can't do just that. Yeah, it is very, uh, you know, as you look at it and you say, hmm, we know the bishops have engaged in this, so we can't say anything. That... I, I don't know if it's a great excuse or not, but on some legal island that was sort of true, it isn't now, hasn't been for you know four years, yeah. and it certainly isn't right now yeah. in the midst of this election. So they can come out and say whatever they want. And you know, very few except the Biden backers are saying anything at all. Yeah. You know, it's uh, as you look at this also, this uh, uh, interview that we did with uh, Trey Trainer and, and uh, put up yesterday, uh, chairman of the Federal Election Commission, he was very, uh, he was just pretty blunt, you know, he's a good Catholic and he just said, you know, this is ridiculous. This, you know, bishops hiding behind this and, you know, not doing their thing. Well, of course, you know who, you know, that was the cue call for. Uh, James Martin, Father James Martin, uh, tweeted uh, out the following. He said, the chairman of the Federal Election Commission has opined that the U.S. Catholic bishops are hiding behind their tax exempt status to avoid endorsing candidates. No, they're not endorsing because it's a terrible idea, and both the USCCB and Pope Francis 
agree on this. That's not right. There's kind of like a little circular logic built in there. You say the bishops aren't doing it because the bishops don't want to do it. <laughs> no, that's not a, you know. And first of all, uh, uh, you know, Cardinal Tobin did come out yeah, and do exactly. it. Pretty he just much. came exactly. out and it was that two, most, two days ago? Yeah, just it's on social media, just came most, out. Wasn't Father James Martin like at the DNC? Or did I, yes. did I yeah, miss yeah. that? Yeah. So, so he was like at the DNC. Sure. What was he doing there? Well, he says, I was just there to pray. Was he? I was just praying. I mean, to his credit, he did say the unborn, pre-born or unborn, I think it was unborn. But you know, then he included, you know, the big, the big gar you know, seamless garment lump came in with everything else. You know, those who have a stub toe and those who can't find, you know, you know work for half a minute or what it just you know went through the whole list of things so uh, but you know the idea that the, the church should not be somehow involved uh, in you know political discourse is just you know it's ridiculous and that's not what the Johnson amendment says such so can't endorse you know a religious outfit can't endorse a candidate why not I mean why can't you endorse a candidate what you are you you give up your American citizenship and right to free speech just because you happen to believe in God as well that, that, that's a crazy thing so uh, when we did this uh, interview with Trey, there was one part that came out that was actually, uh, it was pretty good. He, he talked about the idea of the bishops being paid off uh, for their silence. Let's go ahead and rerun that part. It's almost a payoff to the churches is, well, we're going to give you this tax status where you don't have to pay taxes. Just please don't talk about anything political. Um, and the bishops have bought into that hook, line, and sinker, um, and they're, not, they, they're no longer participating. Um, I honestly believe that there really would be no way for the government to tax the church. I think you would, I think you would get there. You would get into a separation of church and state type issue, sure. establishment clause issue, um, where taxing the church reg based upon what it's saying politically, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're going to get into establishment. Yeah, uh, clause controlling issues. your free speech. Absolutely. It's interesting that, uh, it's interesting that Cardinal Tobin actually took him up on that and said, well, actually, I agree with Trey Trainer because here, let me say uh, that, you know, I think we should all vote for Biden. And uh, we actually have that little clip also right here for you. I think that a person in good conscience could vote for Mr. Biden. I frankly, in, in, my, in my own way of thinking, have a more difficult time with, with the other option. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> he said it. There it is. There's a bishop saying you can go ahead and vote for this guy. Mention him by name. He's a, he can't be much more religious than a cardinal of a you know of a major archdiocese in the country. So he violates the rules there. One last thing, I want to play a clip also. Uh, one more clip from the Trey Trainer interview where he talks about the bishops using uh, this all as a shield uh, to just uh, you know hide behind, uh, while so they don't tick anybody off and they can get their money. The, the bishops are using their nonprofit status as a shield to hide behind from having to make a, a decision about who to support and to come out publicly and put meat on the bones of, a, you know, they say we should have an informed conscience when we go vote, but they never really take that next step and say, here's who meets the criteria. Once you've, once you've formed your conscience right. and you know what the position of the church is on the issues, here are the candidates that really meet those uh, guidelines. And they hide behind that nonprofit uh, status. And, and if you think about that, they're falling right into the trap that Justice Black set, which is he wanted to silence the church. He wanted to keep the church from teaching truth. Yeah. They did pretty well up until uh, this interview, and now Cardinal Tobin's out saying his thing. That's ticked off James Martin. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah, as you mentioned, you know, the Johnson Amendment. This is so really the Johnson Amendment is sort of the one of the foundations of why so many bishops are hesitant to speak out politically and why they place these gag orders on their clergy. And trainer has come out and said, basically, this is probably, you know, unlawful. They may not have the, you know, ability in law to place these gag orders on their priests not to speak politically because priests owe their bishops um, the vow of obedience in the matter of faith and morals. But that's it. You know, the bishop can't just come in and say um, whether or not you can speak politically. But as you said, the Johnson Amendment, this is an amendment that was um, sponsored by Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, and it was after he was defeated in his political race. And he was very upset. And he attributed his defeat in part to various nonprofits that were kind of engaging and sort of campaigning for the other side. And so he decided kind of on his own, quietly, to amend the tax code in 1954. Um, to grant tax-exempt status to 501c3 nonprofits as long as 
they were willing to give up any rights to engage in any sort of political activity, campaigning, you know, endorsing anything like that. Okay, so that's the Johnson Amendment. But this, the Johnson Amendment, was essentially based on this false notion of separation of church and state that was enshrined in the Constitution, thanks to Justice Hugo Black. Now, Justice Black has quite the history that many people actually don't know about. Justice Black was a card-carrying member of the KKK. The KKK was notoriously anti-Catholic, anti-Jew, anti-immigrant, anti-black, all of that. Now, he was a member for only two years. He decided to resign before he did his Senate run because he thought maybe politically this wouldn't look good that I'm a member of the KKK. So he <laughs> runs for Senate. <laughs> the principal state he was in at the yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But this is what's interesting. So Justice Black uh, was responsible for the case Everson v. Board of Education, which is the very first constitutional case that, and, and here, it actually became a great scandal when it, it became public that he was um, a KKK member. It was a huge scandal, and then he tried to distance himself from it and all that and say, oh no, you know, I'm not, I don't pay attention to them anymore. But he was responsible for enshrining the phrase separation of church and state in this landmark case. Now, this case actually involved Catholic schools, money going to Catholic schools. Black, being an, a, a, you know, rabid anti-Catholic, of course, came in, says there is separation of church and state. This is the interesting thing, and what people don't understand. Um, the Klansman's Creed, which every single person who wants to become a Klansman has to, he has to make an oath, he has to take this creed, he has to promise this, 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 this. In that creed, you have to pledge allegiance to the eternal separation of church and state. Literally, that's the phrase. I pledge allegiance to the eternal separation of church and state. <laughs> Hugo Black took that uh, oath, and then you see the oath pop up in a constitutional case, and now it's enshrined in constitutional law, First Amendment jurisprudence, and now every bishop uses it to silence his priests. And it's wrong. It's completely wrong. But Trey Trainer actually discusses Black's anti-Catholicism. Let's go ahead and hear what he has to say. Justice Black was a devout follower of the Ku Klux Klan. He is on record many times making disparaging comments about Catholics, about Jews, and his whole purpose in writing the decision was to push down the growth of uh, Catholic schools and religious schools in the country. And he's achieved just that. I mean, we've taken for gospel that, you know, there has to be the separation of church and state. Although so that's what the 2017 executive order by Trump is trying to remedy, is the inequities in the Johnson Amendment. Because there are other, there are other ways in which the Johnson Amendment is considered unconstitutional. Not only does it muzzle our right to free speech, but it's also applied inequally. So 501c3s are the only ones who are muzzled by this Johnson Amendment. There are other non nonprofits, tax exempt groups that are not muzzled, like for instance, colleges. Colleges can be nonprofits, but they're professors, which are paid, empl paid employees. They they can go and endorse whoever they want. Nothing's ever done. And I do. Think, and they so, do. but why I can't? Think the NFL why can't is we? Speaking of nonprofit, yeah, it is. Right. Which is so which is I found that out like two or three days that's ago. Like, like, that's like really? that's religious. That's yeah. religious discrimination. Yeah. That's sure singling out one group and saying no, you can't talk. Oh, but you you guys can. Uh, yeah, and the hook is separation of church and state. Separation of yeah. church and so. state. Yeah, I mean, it's it's to be honest, it's it's an issue that's actually come up a number of times. That people mm -hmm. have actually come to us and said, you know, why are you a nonprofit? And this was many years ago. People said, why are you a nonprofit? And, you know, because you're 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 taking from the government at that point. You're you're benefiting from what the government is giving you. You know just come out and you know be a, a regular corporation do it. It's like, well no, we're a religious nonprofit because that's what we do. We we teach we teach religiously with with regard to that. And in many ways that thought, that idea that you know that that you're taking some sort of largesse from the government at that point uh, the highlights are Completely tangential, but interesting flaw is that it's this idea that all money belongs to the government, yeah. and, and that they just get, they let you keep some of it, which is completely wrong. I mean, you, you have this whole argument that like taxation is, many people say ta all taxation is theft. Now, I don't agree with that, but there's, it comes a certain point when taxation becomes unnecessary, when taxation becomes onerous, when taxation becomes theft, and in many cases, you know, that these the ability to be a non-profit and to be acting uh, in the benefit for society is uh, extremely advantageous. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all the time we have for today's discussion. We'll be right back after the break for final thoughts. Church Militant is working behind the scenes with law enforcement and whistleblowers. It's a classic case of putting the fox in charge of the hen house. To help expose corruption and abuse, all with the goal of removing, prosecuting, or 
if necessary, imprisoning compromised clergy. Investigators, law enforcement, whistleblowers, we invite you to work with us through Church Militant's Action Arm. That's it for today. Thanks very much for joining us. If there was ever a time to pray, it's now. Get out there, register to vote, and cast your ballot to preserve Western civilization. We'll see you tomorrow right here on The Download.